want to visit with you about the documents that should be included in any complete estate plan. In my office, when we do a complete estate planning package, we include all of these documents for a client. So we have the trust, which we talked about in chapter three, and that's very, very important and an integral part of the plan. And sometimes they're very complex and sometimes they're very straightforward. We have a motto at my office, which is if you can dream it, I can draft it. So you can be as creative as you want to be with the terms or with how things are, are selected and done. But aside from the trust itself, the body of the document, we have the certification of trust. It's essentially the cleft notes to your trust that the rest of the world can see. The terms of your trust, the dispositive provisions are really no one else's business. Also in a trust package, we include a memorandum of personal property. That covers all of the tangible personal property items that might be very important and sentimental to you or your family. And it allows you to list those out and to change those without having to come back into the office and pay us to do an amendment to the trust. So you'll have several of those sheets included. You can just spell out, you know, I want grandma's diamond tennis bracelet to go to little Abigail and I want grandpa's shotgun to go to little Johnny and you can change those as your stuff changes. So that covers the trust itself. The other documents that are vitally important to a good comprehensive plan is the general power of attorney. The general power of attorney is the document that basically says anything that you can do, the appointed person that you've named in the power of attorney can do for you. So let's say that you name your spouse first and your two children jointly second. It means if you are not able to make a decision, meaning change your cell phone plan or contact um, a company and find out what your required minimum distribution is on your IRA. I mean, it can be something as simple as having re reporting an electrical outage to something as complex as dealing with an IRA rollover. So the power of attorney document governs all of those types of day-to-day -day decisions if you're not able to make those decisions for yourself. So you can see with the trust and the able to manage the money and the power of attorney able to manage those important decisions, those two things work together to prevent a guardianship from being appointed through the court. You get to be in charge of who you name on those documents. So aside from the general power of attorney, we also have a medical power of attorney. And that governs who would have the ability to make medical decisions for you. So if you're not able to make a decision for yourself, and it may just be something as simple as um, there's two choices in your carpal tunnel surgery, but you're under anesthesia. So there's a, a problem that's arisen and there's two choices on how to fix it. The doctor can walk into the waiting room and visit with the person appointed as your medical power of attorney or call them on the phone or send them an email and, and get the information to them. So medical power of attorney is very important as well. And after HIPAA has come out, even if you have an old power of attorney, usually pre about 2004, that's not going to work. You need to have your estate planning attorney review it and you probably will need to have it redone. So we have the general power of attorney, the medical power of attorney, and you need a separate HIPAA release. That's the privacy act that allows the person or the people that you've appointed to have access to your information that's protected under the privacy act. It's important to have that document because that can actually stay effective for up to two years after you die. So if there's difficulty communicating with medical records um, or having trouble getting records or paying bills, that document can be very, very important. We also do include a living will, which is a free document that you can get on our website. And that is a document that is really should be free from your hospital. You can usually get it free online from your state. Uh, our, the one on our websites for the state of Oklahoma. That is a statutory form. So there's no magic to that document. If you get the document and it's the most recent version, that will be just fine. That's one of the few documents you can just put the person's name into the little blank and it will work perfectly because you can't change it. It's a statutory form. People usually go, oh my goodness, you've got living will, last will and testament, trust, living trust, revoke, what, is, what are all these differences? Well, a trust is what we talked about in chapter three, the vehicle that transfers your assets on death. A last will and testament is also a vehicle that transfers assets on death, but it does go to probate. 
A living will, or also called an advanced directive for healthcare, just deals with life support decisions. So it's just a pull the plug document, uh, whether you stay on life support or don't stay on life support. So that's what a living will does. And again, that is just a statutory form. Every state has a different form, but they are valid from state to state. Then whenever we do a trust, we do also include a last will and testament. You go, well, why is that? Because if I have a trust, it should avoid probate. I shouldn't need a will. That's right. We hope you don't use the will that we give you, but it's called a pour over will. The pour over will is just a last will and testament that says anything that I have, I want it to go to my revocable trust. That way, if you have an asset out there that you should have an ownership interest in that maybe you don't know about, and in Oklahoma, a lot of times that's mineral interests that we have that come out. So if there's a mineral interest out there that later uh, comes into light after you're gone, that pour over will can take that mineral interest and pour it over and put it into your revocable living trust. Again, we don't wanna use the will because that does mean there's a probate, but it's there just in case we need it. The other nice thing that the will can do, we talked about guardianship of minor children, so the will does spell out who would be the guardian of any minor children as well. The other piece is the trust funding, because quite honestly, the trust isn't gonna be worth the paper it's written on if your assets aren't in it. The only reason that the trust works is if your assets are held in the name of the trust. If you're not in the name of the trust, it's still laying out on the table and it's probably gonna go in box number two, which is the probate box. Um, we're gonna move on now and if you, uh, are, if you have a spouse, then there is actually an opportunity for the trust to save um, estate taxes and offer some asset protection strategies. So we're gonna move on to our next segment and, and discuss how that can be done with the trust. Mm -hmm.